Hello, this is Jerry Morton. Welcome to my Finding My Way podcast. This is podcast number 37, titled Your Weapon. Podcasts 34 through 61 are stories from the year of Army training I experienced. The training started in August 1966 and ended in June 1967. The stories are published in the book Reluctant Lieutenant, from Basic to OCS in the 60s, which was published by Texas A&M University Press, as a military history. Your Weapon is an account of the Army's way of teaching beginners in basic training about their weapon, the M14 rifle, in September 1966. Jerry learned how to do rifle drills, fire his weapon, and clean and maintain it. An accident on the firing range emphasized the danger inherent in having a loaded weapon. Your weapon. This is your weapon. It will keep you alive. You must treat it with respect. You must take care of it so that it can take care of you, Sergeant Boone said to our platoon. We were standing at attention with our weapons pressed against our right legs, with their butts on the ground in a position known as order arms. You held the rifle parallel to your body by grasping the upper part of the stock just right with your fingers holding your right arm down straight at your side and cocking your wrist up, put your fingers in the perfect position. You will learn the manual of arms. You will learn to clean and maintain your weapon. You will learn to fire your weapon. Do you understand? He demanded. Yes, Sergeant, we all shouted in unison. This was just like they did it in the movies, I thought, feeling a slight sense of comfort in that realization. Sergeant Boone demonstrated a position he called port arms. After drawing himself to attention, he said, On my command, you will pull the rifle up with your right hand while moving your left hand to your chest in preparation to receive it from your right hand. As he talked, He slowly executed the movement, keeping in sync with his words. As you bring the rifle up to your chest area, you grasp the receiver with your left hand while shifting your right hand from the upper hand guard below the muzzle to the small of the stock near the butt. At this time, you are holding the rifle with both hands at a 45-degree angle to your head, so that it bisects your body from your right hip across your chest to your left shoulder. Are there any questions? Sergeant Boone's glare openly did dared anyone to ask a question. He returned the rifle to order of arms and then demonstrated the movement at normal cadence. It was smooth, quick, efficient, and simple. When he finished, he looked from one side of the formation to the other and asked, Everybody got that? Yes, Sergeant, we roared in unison. Platoon, he shouted. Attention! He paused while we snapped into position and then hollered, Port! Horns! I hauled my rifle briskly to my chest with my right hand. It felt heavier than I expected. Just before I completely lost my grip, I caught the barrel with my left hand and moved the thing into position. I was at port arms. My concentration had been so intense that not until I had achieved my goal did it become apparent that several men had been unable to complete the maneuver. They were either picking up their weapons from the pavement or still fumbling with 
getting their rifles across their chest. I had the feeling it was going to be a long morning. Shoulder, arms, means putting their rifle on your shoulder so you can march with it the way they do in parades. Right shoulder arms and left shoulder arms are the commands for which shoulder to put it on. In a maneuver called inspection arms, you went to port arms and then exposed the inside of the receiver so that the sergeant could check to see if you had a bullet seated in the chamber. He did not want to see a bullet in the chamber. That, presumably, was why he had you open it. He wanted to be sure that you remembered to take out all of the bullets before you left the firing range. This significantly reduced the possibility of accidentally shooting someone. The movement was executed by sliding the palm of your hand down the side of the rifle so that the edge of it caught the protruding piece of metal attached to the bolt and forced it back so you could then stick your thumb inside, push down on the piece of metal in there, and lock the bolt open with a satisfying click. This required coordination, strength, and speed. It was a difficult maneuver to do in one fluid motion. If you did not hit the lever just right, the thing would pull back only to slip off the edge of your palm and slide back shut with a sharp clapping sound. Those who failed to execute the movement properly were immediately identified by the sound. Our platoon sounded like an appreciative audience at a bad high school play. Fortunately, no one had gotten his thumb caught inside the receiver. If you did, they said it usually meant that you would lose the nail. Sergeants Boone and Zarkani did their best to get us to execute this drill so that our rifles clicked rather than clapped. They never fully succeeded. The two finesse moves in the Manual of Arms are stacking arms and fixing bayonets. It takes three men to stack arms. The middle guy leans his rifle forward while standing at attention without moving from that position in any other way. The guys on either side of him step forward with their nearest foot and insert their rifles into the tightened sling of his rifle. They then lower the heels of the butts of their rifles to the ground and move back to the position of attention. Miraculously, the three rifles form a tripod and stand. The order given before stacking arms is, Prepare to stack arms. When it is given, everyone adjusts their rifle slings so they are nice and taut. Hearing the command, Fix bayonets, always gave me the chill. It is one thing to be shooting at a bullseye target or a green silhouette of a man's upper torso. However, it just does not seem real. Being told to fix bayonets puts it in your face. You might hear it given just before an enemy attack, in which case you will most likely have someone try to jump on you and bite your face off, stab you, stomp on your head, or some such thing. Your bullets will have failed to keep this killer off of you. Or maybe you simply run out of bullets. Perhaps there are more of them than you and the others can shoot before they are on top of you. In any event, something has either gone wrong or is about to go wrong if you are given the order to fix bayonets. If you have to fix bayonets in battle, you are probably going to die. You will die in pain, certainly more slowly than if you are shot to death. Ugh, I did not like to think about it. Mostly I did not. However, when I heard the order, Fix bayonets, I think about it. 
When the order fix is shouted, you move your right hand up the barrel of the rifle to the muzzle and lean the barrel forward with the stock still beside your right foot. On the next word, bayonets, you move your left hand over and grasp the barrel while releasing your right hand. You then move your right hand smoothly across your stomach to your left hip where your bayonet hangs from your belt in its scaber. After unsnapping the cover over the handle of the bayonet, you grasp it firmly in your right hand and pull it out of the scabbard while making a smooth circular motion with your right hand until the blade is pointed skyward. You then slip the ring at the base of the handle over the muzzle and slide it down the barrel until the second smaller ring at the front of the handle slides over the muzzle and then seats itself firmly on the little clips at the base of the handle and clamp down on the studs below the muzzle. This strongly affixes the bayonet to the weapon, creating a solid bond between the weapon and the blade. They are one. When that move is completed, you return to the position of attention with your rifle at order arms. It is a very efficient maneuver. No motion is wasted. You are then ready to bring your weapon to port arms from which you can either defend yourself or launch an attack of your own. We marched and marched with our weapons. When we were not marching, we were drilling the manual of arms. Then it was time to return the weapons to the arms room. That was where the company stored our weapons. We had to open the breach so the sergeants could verify that we had no rounds in the chambers. Of course we did not. All we did was drill and march in formation. No one gave us any ammo. Next you filed into the storage area and placed your rifle in the rifle rack with your rifle's serial number on it. That serial number was important. The rifles all looked the same. That one rifle is your responsibility. No one messes with your rifle. After you left, someone ran a chain through all of the trigger guards and put a padlock on the chain. The process was repeated in reverse order the next morning. Of course, we did our morning airborne shuffle before breakfast. Then we got our weapons. The M14 rifle is a solid weapon. Its wooden stock is solid. The whole piece has weight to it. When you are carrying it at high port, you know you have something strong to hang on to. If you had to use it as a club, it would do a good job. No one wants to be hit in the head with it. The only time I had ever fired a rifle was one summer at Boy Scout camp. It was a lightweight 22 caliber weapon. They would not let you carry it around with you. You got it at the firing range, paid for your six bullets, and then shot at the target. I did not have much money to waste on bullets. Other than that, I had fired someone else's shotgun a few times. That was the extent of my firearm experience. The M14 felt the way a rifle ought to feel, as you would imagine a deer rifle, a 30-30 hunting rifle felt. You know, the kind the mountain men carried around, the kind of weapon John Wayne's movie character used, a man's weapon. After we had all drawn our weapons, Sergeant Soto had the company form up. He gave shouting manual of the arms commands. As soon as he would give an order, the platoon sergeants would repeat that command to their respective platoons. When Sergeant Spoon spoke, we moved. Collectively, we were pitiful. The platoon sergeants and their assistants were scurrying through the ranks, singling out the most pitiful and telling them exactly how pitiful they were. It was all redundant. 
Fortunately, my pitiful efforts were less pitiful than some of the more pitiful others. No one got into my face. Sergeant Soto called us all to attention. Silence reigned, except for the continuous coughing. I had kind of gotten used to it. Everyone was supposed to be silent when we were at attention. But the coughing never stopped. There was never a point when it could not be heard. I had begun to get a runny nose. Clearing my throat threatened to become a habit of necessity. Sergeant Soto glared at us. He strode back and forth in front of the formation. We stood at attention, holding our collective breath. Something was about to happen. Abruptly, he stopped in front of a man in 2nd Platoon and screamed, Port Horns! There was a collective sucking in of air. The lone soldier snapped his weapon smartly into position. It was perfect. Left shoulder, Horns! demanded Sergeant Soto. The guy moved swiftly and correctly. Right shoulder, Horns! was the quick follow-up order. The targeted man moved like a finely crafted watch. Soto barked out order after order, and he moved briskly through the movements without error. Who was this guy? Thank God I had not been singled out like that. How did he learn to do all those maneuvers so fast? No smile creased Sergeant Soto's face. He slowly turned away and gave the order to march us off to begin the day's activities. We were ordered onto trucks. They took us to a cleared area in the woods. After forming up and stacking arms, we were ushered into bleachers facing a cleared surface with packed mud. Several sergeants were moving in front of us, and two of them lugged a frame holding a large flip chart with a picture of an M14 on the first page and set it down roughly centered on the bleachers. We were about to receive our first of a never-ending series of military training lectures. This is the M14. It is your weapon, began the primary instructor, pointing at the picture. You will learn the nomenclature of all parts. You will disassemble and assemble your weapon until you can do it with your eyes closed while someone is shouting in your face. You will learn to clean your weapon and keep it operational under all kinds of conditions so that it can keep you alive in Vietnam. Do you understand, he demanded. He was right. We learned how to disassemble and assemble it. After the lecture, we were formed into small groups. The other instructors came out and sat with us. They were all very patient and soft-spoken. You could get help any time you asked, and they were quite pleasant about it. I learned the basics quickly. Every 15 minutes, we got a 10-minute break. During one of the breaks, we began discussing the amazing control the guy in 2nd platoon displayed under Sergeant Soto's demanding eye. Someone said the guy had gone to the Coast Guard Academy the previous year and decided to quit. He got sucked into the Army right after that. I had heard during the first year at the service academies you were constantly harassed by upperclassmen. Sergeant Soto was not going to rattle this guy. I had a long way to go to achieve that degree of skill. In the process, I did not want to draw attention to myself. Doing so would not be good. Cleaning your weapon is a tedious process. When the inside of the barrel is perfectly clean, it shines. To check it, you put your thumb inside the firing chamber. With your thumbnail reflecting the light up the barrel, you can look down it and see both the shining metal and the grooves of the rifling. Unfortunately, 
You can also see any dirt that may be in it. I am not sure that the dirt is dirt. When a bullet passes through the barrel, hot gases from the exploding gunpowder follow it up. That is why you see the muzzle flash as the bullets leave. The gases burst into flame as they come out of the muzzle because they get enough oxygen to flame up. Meanwhile, the hot gases passing through the barrel leave carbon deposits. Firing your weapon dirties the barrel. The more rounds you fire, the dirtier your weapon gets, which means you will have to spend more time running your cleaning rod through the barrel. There is a cotton patch that you put through a hole in the tip of the cleaning rod. It looks like a huge needle. Rather than running your patch all the way through the needle, you leave it there with half of it sticking out either side of the eye at the tip of the cleaning rod. First, however, you douse the patch in cleaning solvent. Then you keep running the rod up and down the inside of the barrel, changing patches repeatedly. It takes forever and never seems to do the job perfectly. Although that is how your sergeant wants it done. If it does not please him, he will keep you at it while others do more pleasant things. When your rifle finally passes in inspection, you can sometimes get privileges. For example, the cleanliness of your rifle seem to be a key factor in being selected to serve as the orderly for the officer of the day, called the OD. That was privileged duty indeed. Being an orderly was the same as being a gopher. You ran errands for the OD whenever he wanted you to get something. Usually, the only thing he asked for was coffee. At least that is what those selected always said. I do not really know, having never served my country in that way. Lieutenant Brown displayed a bad habit during the classes on breaking down our weapons. Whenever he found someone not paying attention to the instructors or making a significant mistake, he would hit them on their helmet liner with his little swagger stick. Our helmet liners were made of some sort of plastic. They fit inside our steel pots and had straps around the inside rim that you could adjust so it fit fairly snugly on your head. Painted army green, it looked just like the regular steel helmet, but it was a lot lighter. When we had to wear the steel pots, like when we went to the rifle range, or participated in field exercises, we just put them over the helmet liner. They made a good fit. Happily, we were not required to wear the steel pots much of the time. When the bullet casing tip of the lieutenant swagger stick struck someone's helmet liner, it made a loud clicking sound to those standing near the impact. To the one wearing the impacted helmet liner, the sound must have been greatly intensified, or so it seemed, judging from the wearer's startled reactions. Accentuating the startled response was the recipient's total unawareness that he was about to be struck. Lieutenant Brown had developed a keen ability to approach from his intended victim's rear or blind side. One moment the hapless soldier was enjoying the numbness of mind disconnect, and the next he was immersed in jarring sound. The startled reaction was always the same. An instantaneous straightening of the back with a quick jerk of the head toward the point of impact of the swagger stick with the rest of the upper body following the turn of the head as the mind struggled to grasp the situation. The trucks brought us to the rifle range. We clambered out of the backs of them and formed up in front of the ammo point, where we were issued ammo and magazines before we entered the range. 
crisp instructions had been given on how to load our 20 rounds into a magazine. These were followed with instructions on how to insert the magazine into our weapons. The sergeant explained that we only needed to pull the bolt back once to lock and load. After you fired your first round, the weapon automatically ejected the shell casing and shoved the next round in the magazine into the firing chamber. This all happened because the M14 was gas-operated. That is, some of the gas from the exploding gunpowder in the shell casing that pushes the bullet through the barrel at such a high rate of speed bleeds off through a small port and pushes a rod connected to the bolt to the rear. Of course, a lot can go wrong, and often does. You need to know how to fix it in a hurry. They did a good job of teaching us how. The M14 is a semi-automatic weapon. That means you have to pull the trigger every time you want to fire a round. Of course, because it is gas-operated, you can pull the trigger very fast. The weapon can also be fired in the automatic mode. One pull of the trigger and it just keeps firing until your magazine is empty. There is a little thing on the side of the rifle by the receiver that you adjust to put it into automatic firing mode. We were told not to attempt to set it for automatic firing on our own. Someone else would take care of that for us at the proper time. A few of the guys immediately started fooling with the mechanism when it was brought to our attention. The rapid clicks of helmet liners being struck by Lieutenant Brown's swagger stick attested to that fact. Having a hang fire out on the range was a bad thing. It meant that you had pulled the trigger and the firing pin struck the end of the bullet, but nothing happened. A dangerous situation. Your bullet could be cooking off, meaning that the gunpowder inside the casing is burning slowly. If that is the case, it will eventually fire the round. We were taught never to eject a round that hang fired because it could go off as it flew through the air or on the ground. They told us to keep our rifles pointed downrange and not swing them around because the bullet could fire at any moment and someone might get hit. We were to immediately call out, Hang fire! and wait for someone to come and assist. The important thing was to remain very still with your rifle pointed downrange. Everything was very precise on the firing range. It is a place where people can get killed. There were always a lot of sergeants and lieutenants around. A guy in a tower overlooking the fire line issued instructions over a PA system, telling us exactly what to do. The sergeants moved quickly to anyone not following the instructions or who had raised a hand for help. It is a serious place. Once everyone was in place, the guy in the tower told the occupants of the foxholes facing the bullseye targets downrange with their rifles pointed in the same direction, Lock and load! Knowing that their magazines held live ammo, the firers silently went about their diddly business. Ready on the right, asked the man in the tower. Ready on the right, shouted back the sergeants in charge of the right section of the line. Ready on the left, the tower questions. Ready on the left, comes the reply. All ready on the firing line. Commence firing! The order is complete. Noise dominates the scene. The smell of cordite burns your eyes and stings the inside of your nostrils. 
No one firing notices these things until the tower orders, Cease fire! Cease fire! Cease fire! The first phase is intended simply to get us used to firing our weapons. The second phase is to get us to zero the sights. Each person has unique firing characteristics. It might be due to the slightest of variations with eyesight or thousands of other unidentifiable quirks. In turn, each weapon has its own little nuances. Zeroing your weapon means that you make slight adjustments to the sighting mechanism on your rifle until you and your rifle are in sync. You know this is the case when you have a tight shot group, meaning you have put three rounds through the bullseye of the target in a tight cluster. Well, at least close to the bullseye anyway, and hopefully close enough together to form a visible group. For some, the concept of a shot group was broadly defined. The tighter your shot group is, the greater the probability you will hit what you are aiming at. This becomes more dramatically true at the distance between you and your target increases. If you correctly zeroed in your weapon, you knew you could hit what you were aiming at as long as you held it in your sights. Without a properly zeroed weapon, the likelihood of your hitting what you aimed at was low. Time after time, we went through the firing range ritual. It was getting to be old hat. The tension lessened as we waited for the tower operator and his assistants on the firing line to go through their rituals. Haircut Louie was fidgeting around with his weapon as his group waited for the ritual to begin. They were given the order to lock and load, but Louie continued to fidget. The lieutenant was walking quickly toward him. Ready on the right, blared the tower. Lieutenant Brown raised his swagger stick as he approached Louis, who was still messing with his weapon. The sergeant replied, Ready on the right. One more step and the lieutenant would be there. Ready on the left, the tower operator asked in his dull, boring manner, as the lieutenant's swagger stick came down, clank, rang Louis's helmet as his head turned back and his torso followed, swinging the M14's muzzle from downrange to flank the firing line. Crack, 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 crack. Bullets spat out from the rifle. Geysers of dirt shot up. Sergeants dove into the ground. Everyone in the foxholes intuitively ducked down. Louis had sprayed the firing line with live fire. No one was hit. A hush fell over the range. Slowly, people began to move. Then it was a mad rush of sergeants converging on Louis. He was removed from his foxholes, and the lieutenant left. We never saw Lieutenant Brown on the firing line after that. For that matter, we never saw his swagger stick again either. After we finished cleaning our weapons and had returned them to the arms room, we were addressed by a sergeant who had more stripes on his sleeve than I had ever seen before. He was the company first sergeant, and a dapper man he was. His neat, pencil-thin mustache had just a fleck of gray in it. His thin frame was lean and fit so that his small stature was an asset to his personal appearance. No doubt about it, he was a diminutive David Niven. One got the impression that he would be retiring soon. He had the look of having been around a long, long time. Calling us to gather around him, he spoke softly and kindly. After explaining a few details about his role as first sergeant, he asked us how we liked the Army. There were a few chuckles, but the men seemed to murmur agreement that it was all right under the circumstances. It was obvious this guy had real power. 
He told us that we could ask him anything we wanted. One fellow asked if we would be able to go to church on Sunday. Of course we would, the first sergeant replied. There would be time off in the morning for everyone. You either stayed in the barracks or you went to church. It was your choice. Someone asked when he could use the phone to call his wife. He told us that we would be able to use the phone, the one pay phone, in the barracks at the end of the following week whenever we got some free time. The next questioner wanted to know when we would get a weekend pass. He dodged that question a little, saying that we could receive visitors on Sunday of our fourth week. Family members, wives, sweethearts, and friends would then be welcome to come and visit. Why, we could even have a picnic with them in a designated spot. As a further incentive, the three soldiers who received the top scores on the rifle qualification test would be awarded a weekend pass the following weekend. Since we took the test around the fifth week, it meant the sharpshooters would be able to go off post during the sixth weekend. Well, that was that. Anna and I would not be able to be with each other until sometime after basic training. It just would not be worth it for her to fly up here for a Sunday afternoon visit. Moreover, there was not a chance in hell that I would be among the three best shots in the company. Zeroing my weapon had been harder than I had imagined it would be. Almost everyone else succeeded. I always had one bullet that strayed from the shot group. I just hoped I would be able to make the minimum qualifying score when the time came. Without that score, I would have to take basic training over again. That would be just lost time. It would delay my getting to OCS. No matter how long it took me to get OCS, I would still have two years of time to serve. Just getting to OCS had the potential of being a long, frustrating process. There would be a one-week or two-week leave time after graduation from basic training. We would know how long as soon as we got our orders for our next assignments at the graduation ceremony. Some would be sent to specialty schools, and others would go to advanced infantry training. I asked if that meant going directly to OCS. No. Everyone going to OCS would first have to go through the eight-week-long AIT, Advanced Infantry Training, program, he explained. That was news to me. I was sure, well, pretty sure, the Cincinnati recruiting sergeant had told me that I would go to basic training and then to OCS. No mention was made of advanced infantry training. This was bad. I was depressed and mad. First sergeant, I yelled from the back of the pack. Someone told me that I'm eligible for a direct commission as a first lieutenant in the Medical Services Corps because I have a master's degree in psychology. It was true that one of the college guys had told me that, but I had doubted the truthfulness of it. Besides, after basic training, I would be going to OCS, and with the high scores I was sure to get, I would be in the Adjutant General Corps in no time. Well, now I was not so sure what was true and not true. What's your name, soldier? He asked. I told him, and he wrote it on a piece of paper. I'll check into it for you and let you know, came his fatherly response. I hated for everyone to see me stand out like that. I did not want anyone thinking I thought I was better than everyone else. That had already happened to a few guys. 
They were paying the price with isolation and pulling shit details handed out by the pretend squad leaders and other temporary trainee office holders. More significantly, the core group of trainees was made up of rough-edged guys who had the clear markings of tough street fighters. They were not people I wanted to have irritated at me. Thus far, I had interacted well enough with everyone. I fit in with whatever social grouping I found myself. Having been the only Caucasian deckhand on an ocean-going dredge boat during college summer breaks had taught me to value and respect those who worked all their lives with their muscles, knowing that they would probably never get the chance to do otherwise. Mostly, it never occurred to them that they might get a better break in life. They liked getting drunk on Friday and Saturday nights. There were a lot of laughs to be had at the drinking fest. They liked being strong and kicking butt every once in a while. I understood that feeling. There were some real good times to be had living that way. It was not, however, the way I wanted to live my life. I had other alternatives. They mostly did not. I had seen more than one horse's behind get his clock clean during my time. It was usually from a sucker punch the guy never saw coming. If he was lucky, he went down and out right then. Being conscious enough to try to get up was bad. He was at the mercy of his attacker. That is not the time for mercy. A barrage of kicks to the head and body would follow. The horses behind was definitely better off getting knocked unconscious by the first blow. Kindness could be shown to him later, after he had regained consciousness and acknowledged the victor's superiority. The pecking order would be set. No more asshole behavior toward the strongest. That matter was then settled. All was right with the world. Everyone could get drunk together and share some laughs. My letter to Anna that night was joyous. I had told her I would be able to spend a week or two with her after basic.